we are here today with Stanley Wheeler, author of the, hold on, I can, I can pronounce words, Tomahawks and Dragonfire series, as well as several other books in different genres. Uh, now, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what you're working on at the moment, and then we'll get into the books that you've got out, because that's always fun. Okay. Well, let's see. Uh, my name is Stanley Wheeler. I uh, live in Idaho, and I like to write books. And, uh, you know, that's the nutshell version of me. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I, I'm currently working as a prosecutor um, uh -huh. in, a, in a small county in Idaho. Uh -huh. I really enjoy it, work with some great people, um, you know, at least on one side of the aisle. And um, it's a great place to live. I love the small town life. Mm -hmm. Let's see, now, you asked me about gosh, what I was Idaho has all the, uh, the Cascades, yeah? The Cascades, I believe, are uh, a little farther west in Oregon. Oh, okay. I'm geographically challenged, so <laughs> it, this isn't surprising to me. I could, I could be wrong. Okay. Um, yeah, now you got me thinking about that. I'm going to have to look that up later. <laughs> I was just, I was thinking, for some reason I have this picture, okay, there are mountains near, you know, right on the border of Idaho and Washington area, and I can't yeah. remember why I think that. Uh, yeah, and, and there's and there's the Rockies and the Bitterroots over on right. the right. Montana and Idaho side. Yeah. Uh, Montana, Wyoming. Okay, okay. Yeah, so you're kind of boxed in there. Yeah, so if you ever get a chance to go to the Tetons, mm. which is near Yellowstone National Park, um, mm -hmm. It's it's a great a great experience. Yeah, no, I, I grew up in Colorado, so I'm familiar oh. with a lot of the the mountain experience. I just I don't think I've been to the Tetons. Okay. I might have done when I was very small, but it, it's not a memory that sticks. So, all right. Anyways, books. Okay, you asked me what I was currently working on. I'm currently working on the second series, oh. the, the second trilogy which follows the Tomahawks and Dragonfires trilogy. Oh. oh um, I believe that trilogy is going to be called The New Guards. Ooh. The first book is called In the Course. Okay. And I'm about on chapter six in that. Okay. Okay. Well, second series, is this kind of like um, same characters, same world, or same world, different characters, or... Same characters, same world, okay. continuation of their previous adventures. Okay, which means we should probably talk about the first series first, because, you yeah. know. That's, that's, that makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> All right, so tell us a little bit about the first series, well, without spoilers. Okay. Uh, the Tomahawks and Dragonfire series, series it's actually a, the first trilogy, uh, consists of you know, three books like a trilogy should. Um, the first book is called Threading the Rude Eye. Oh, interesting. The second book is called Power to Hurt. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually have a copy of that one uh, with me. Uh, Power to Hurt with the uh, flames on the cover. Ooh. Threading the Rude Eye also has flames on the cover. Sure. Sure. And the third book is called Clamorous Harbingers. Oh, I like that. And it has a beast on the cover that's uh, it's called a stone cat in the story. But it's, pre it's pretty cool looking. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I have the cover on uh, or up on Amazon. And it, oh, okay. It so you've seen it. Cool. Great. Um, the series, the setting is uh, America during the Revolutionary War. Okay. And we've added magic and dragons and other cool beasties. I like it. That's the nutshell. Yeah. History plus, you know, um, magic and, and beasties. It's pretty fun. Yeah. Take two great things and mash them together. <laughs> Very nice. So is this actually like right in the middle of the war or just the same sort of time period? It actually starts in 1775. Okay. Okay. And in the, in the first book, they go through, the main characters travel through revolutionary Boston. Mm -hmm. In fact, they get caught up in the Battle of Bunker Hill. And, um, and, and they don't follow along. They don't stay there. They go farther west. 
And so there are a lot of, uh, you know, I don't follow the Revolutionary mm -hmm. War. And in fact, there are a number of things, you know, this is an alternate history, Flintlock right. fantasy. So, you know, I can change some of the facts and events. Um, we have a lot of famous people that they may come in contact with, but mm -hmm. it's not the famous people that are the focus. It's the characters right, uh, right. from the book, the fictional people. Okay. So what's their journey like? What are they trying to do? Well, as it as the book opens up, there is a uh, fight between ships. Uh, one ship is much smaller and really gets hammered, mm -hmm. and that takes place very quickly. Mm -hmm. This is the opening, and uh, we find um, a, a young French girl named Lucette. Uh, I say young. I should say young woman uh, named Lucette, and she has been entrusted with a map to a cache of, we'll just call it a cache of magic. And and I played a little bit off Cartier's cache um, oh. when Jacques Cartier came to the New World and he wasted a lot of time looking for some stones that he thought were very valuable and took back to the old world and yeah, they weren't really good. <laughs> but we've got some really valuable stuff in this case. So Lucette has this map. She entrusts it to somebody else to get to its uh, the person she's supposed to give it to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, so there are adventures in doing that. And the first trilogy is all about trying to find the cache, uh -huh. getting to the cache of stones, because right. it's a game changer for whoever right. gets it. Okay, interesting. Interesting. Now, you write Flintlock Fantasy, which is still a fairly, if I'm understanding this correctly, new-ish subgenre. To the fantasy genre? Yeah, yeah. Or at least I've not heard of it all that much. Uh, there are a couple of uh, ones I've seen focusing on more on the Napoleonic Wars than the American Revolution, but otherwise I haven't seen all that much. So where did this come from? Not the genre, but your ideas, because genre discussions might take a while. <laughs> yeah, I don't know where the genre came from, but mm, the reason I jumped in was because it's two things that I really like. I, I really like history, and you mentioned the Napoleonic era. That was kind of the first thing that sucked me into history. Yeah. And, and my series may eventually go there, but okay. uh, for now, I was, uh, you know, celebrating the new world and um, its discovery and development, and, and I, I know that somebody else... I don't know who or when, but I know it was many years ago, I had written some kind of book. It might have been called American Dragon. I just cannot remember the name anymore uh, that used the Revolutionary War and also dragons. Interesting. So I'll have I've to never read it, but I like the idea. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, history would be so very different with all of these elements thrown in. Right. And I, and I like the... Uh, the Flintlock era, because while they have the benefit of firearms, it's a fairly marginal benefit. It, you know, one shot <laughs> if you're by yourself. Um, yeah. And then you've got reloading time. And then just the whole atmosphere. You've got revolution, conquest, colonization through the you know, roughly 200-year period, 200 year period in which the Flintlock was in use. So. Right. And right. so uh, that makes for great stories. Oh, absolutely. Because he's, I mean, a lot of times fantasy is the whole, um, well, you either get the urban fantasy with the modern and you get right. uh, also the medieval fantasy. But the in-between bits I don't see as much. And I like that. It's fun. Yeah. It, it sometimes might be called swashbuckling fantasy. Uh, maybe that's a little more intriguing name. Yeah, yeah. I always thought that was a little different, though. I'm really bad at genre identification because there are so many very specific little things that go into making up each genre. True. And I don't claim to be an expert about any of them. <laughs> I just well, like most of them. <laughs> oh, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well, now I get to ask the fun question of, so how much did you break history? <laughs> how much did I break history? Well... Not a lot. Okay. Because in, in my world, the dragons of the new world 
they were there when you know the early settlers, the pilgrims, mm -hmm. um, conquistadors, when when all those came. But they had something that called them back west, and so they had to withdraw uh -huh. from the area for many years. Interesting. Uh, over a century. Interesting. And so that allowed me to then have things develop very nearly as they as they did historically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, is it just dragons and uh, other relative fantasy beasties, or are you um, are people able to use magic and that sort of a thing? There, there is magic. There's magic that originates from these stones, mm -hmm. and there's already some of these stones out. Mm -hmm. um, one of the major bad guys, um, I'll just call him at this point the commander, because that's how he's known through most of the story, and eventually learn more about him and his background and his name. Uh, he has one of these stones, mm -hmm. and um, the person that they're taking the map to, he has one of these stones. And, and of course, they give you uh, uh, various, what we would call magical abilities. Right, sure. And then there are other stones that can be used in conjunction with the main stone. Mm -hmm. to, uh, they're called filter stones that allow the user to do completely different things. Uh, with, with with the stones, with the magical villages. Fun. Now I've forgotten what your original question was. <laughs> that was pretty much the question. Okay. What? Now, now there there that's the main the main magic in the series, mm -hmm. but there's also some other minor magic going on that some of the other characters possess. Okay. Ooh, fun, fun. All right, now let's get into the characters. We've met Lizette. Uh, I presume she's not the only main character since you no. in multiples. No, she, she's just the sweetest. <laughs> um, like I said, Lucette is is uh, a, a young French woman, and the uh, the the main the other main character is Alex, mm -hmm. and he he will go through what we, what we typically think of as the heroic journey. Mm -hmm. When we first meet him, he's got plans. He's got a life planned, and that all gets destroyed. All of his plans get destroyed. He gets sucked into the revolution. He's not a fan of the revolution. Ah. He does not want to be involved. Ah. <laughs> and uh, But nevertheless, he is brought in, and he eventually accepts the invitation uh, to join and to receive this uh, interesting power. Mm -hmm. that uh, that the stones give. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I always feel bad for heroes who have plans beforehand. It's like, yeah, things are going well. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And then... <sighs> exactly. But that helps forge the character. That's true. It does. It does. But I, I feel a little bad for them as a reader. As a writer, I think it's great. It's always fun. Well, and I think that's the point, isn't it? To make you relate and sympathize with the character? Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, that is kind of the point of reading books. <laughs> I mean, learning things is also a good good bit for reading, but uh, in terms of fiction, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so I feel like I want to ask about this next series, but I also probably shouldn't because spoilers would be bad. <sighs> It's coming, though. It's going to be a continuation of the characters and their their um, ongoing adventures, etc. It is. And in fact, it uh, the next book in the course begins in 1776. Oh, okay. That seems reasonable. Well, okay, all of my questions now involve spoilers, so I shan't <laughs> I shan't continue that line instead um and go you have uh, several other books out there if i'm not mistaken uh in various different genres it looks like uh noir fiction westerns that sort of a thing unless i'm that's, completely mistaken in my reading. yes that's me okay very fun very fun so tell us a little bit about that just because we can okay well uh, um I think a lot of readers like to read in multiple genres. I know that I do. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and I like to write what I would like to read. Mm -hmm. 
so the the very first book I wrote, or, or I should say that I finished and moved to publication, was Justice in Season, mm -hmm. which is a Western that takes place in uh, the Idaho Territory uh, about 1863, 1864. Okay, sure. And um, I'd read a newspaper article in the history part that told this interesting story. And I thought, wow, that is such a good story that that should be made into a whole book. And so I fictionalized a lot of it, fictionalized the characters, and mm -hmm. then used some of those events in in my Western book that I wrote. I later wrote a sequel to that, Justice Resurgent. Mm -hmm. um, uh, same characters and and the same time period, immediately after the events in the first book. Sure. But they're both separate standalone. Okay. Um, although the second one is better if you've read the first one. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes that is useful. One of my you you one of my very favorites is called Smoke. Uh huh. This is my uh, detective noir story. Noir and, is uh, much fun. It's it's a lighthearted noir. Noir light. <laughs> well, still, uh, does it have that narrative style that's you know distinctive to the noir fiction? Yeah, so you've got a little bit of Dashiell Hammett or uh, Raymond Chandler vibe to it. Yep. It's told yep. in the first person. Yep. And uh, you go through. Now, I do break some conventions there. Oh. It's told in the first person, but uh, there are some chapters told from a, uh, a third person. Uh-huh. And there is at least one time when he uh, really tells about things that he didn't know about at the time. Uh-huh. And so I asked my readers about that, and they said no, they loved it. They thought that really enhanced the story. So I, I, I broke the rule, and I knew it because I thought it made a better story. Well, I mean, to be fair, conventions are in place so that people can go and break them when necessary. Exactly. It's kind of the fun part. I mean, what would life be without breaking a few of the rules of writing? <laughs> Yes, my wife wants me to write a sequel to Smoke, and mm -hmm. I think I will, but uh, it's, again, it's a standalone, it's a complete story. Sure. But, uh, sure. Sure. but I really do like the characters. They were fun. Yeah? Um, All right, you better tell us a little bit more about them then. Well, I think writing in the first person uh, <laughs> makes it a little more, uh, I don't know, uh, intimate, personalized, mm -hmm. and... So the main character is a he's a veteran of World War II. This takes place in 1948. Okay, sure. And he didn't plan on being a detective, but events or a certain client sucked him into being a detective. Uh oh. And uh, and it's it's all about him trying to solve a murder. Mm -hmm. And uh, the people he meets along the way, and how it, how he eventually uh, solves that. But it for me, it was a a love affair with the 1940s. It sure. was so great to research that and to learn about different aspects: the cars, the music, the, the cars. The cars. Was, yeah. So I loved it. It was a great time. Oh, absolutely! Every time I watch one of those movies, um, and I see the 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 whole scenery you know the people and the cars and the technology it's just like wow that's really cool <sighs> yes history is a foreign country wow yeah and and it's it's awesome <laughs> it's, yeah yeah i'm very fond of it and doing all the research can be very annoying if you don't have the right access to sources and whatnot but i find it fascinating yeah yeah. Especially with Google now. I mean, now with the internet, 40 years ago, <laughs> I yeah. wouldn't have been able to write the book. Well, you would have. Just it would take a lot more afternoons in the library sort of a thing. Exactly. Yeah. You know, the resources available to me, not great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although... I do know there's a certain amount of nostalgia for the pre-internet writing era simply because of the whole, um, if you're self-publishing your book, you also have to self-market and whatnot. Right. 
Yeah, I, I do. I've talked to a lot of people who say, yes, well, wouldn't it have been nice if publishers were still the way they were when they picked you up and they did all of the publicity and the marketing and the cover and everything and you just wrote the book? That would be lovely. So what's your marketing journey going to look like? What does my marketing journey look like? Mm. Uh, probably a train wreck. <laughs> I've uh, I've done little to no marketing. Um, it's like I write the books and then fling them out off the off the uh, into the chasm, <laughs> and uh, hope somebody grabs it on the way down and reads it. <laughs> I mean that's definitely a strategy. Although recently, and that's why I'm on your your broadcast here, is is I was connected with Mike Evans. Mm -hmm. Michael Evans and uh, and so he's currently my publicist and that works into my into at least some marketing plan at least right. people get to know I exist and that I write books yeah and well you start small and then you can grow from there that sort of a thing yeah, yeah. my and philosophy is if I write enough books somebody's going to stumble across one precisely and they hopefully will love it precisely very fun yeah I've at least from the indies I've spoken with, the general strategy seems to be the more books you write, the easier it is to do marketing. Simply because of, you know, you have a lot of uh, possible ways for people to reach you or, or see right. you. So, who knows? Well, I'm certainly open to recommendations if you have any good strategies. Um, I've just figured out how to do Facebook adverts, so I couldn't actually tell you if there's a um, strategy there, just that I finally figured out how to actually get them to show my ads. Okay. So I've heard mixed reviews on those. I've never tried them myself. It took me far longer than I would have liked to figure them out. Yeah. But such is the nature of things. And of course, in six months, I'm sure they'll change the algorithm and I'll have to refigure things out again. Right. <laughs> That is one of the problems. Oh darn. Anyways, moving sideways because we can. Uh, for, gosh, all of your different genres, which are super fun, uh, is there an author in one of those genres whose abilities you'd like to steal to improve your stuff? Oh, that's a really good question. You know, um, I have not written in the military sci-fi genre mm -hmm. but I did just read a book um, called Legionnaire oh I've heard of that one I haven't by read um, Ansbach and Cole Nick mm -hmm. Cole is the second author's name anyway um, that book just sucked me in held me tight all the way through yeah. Um, you know, I didn't want to put it aside. I wanted to read it every chance I got. Yeah. Um, it, it was, in fact, it was told in the uh, first person and in the present tense. Oh, Works in the present tense. Military fiction or military yeah. sci-fi, at least. Books in the present tense generally annoy me, and mm -hmm. I just put them aside. I don't read them. Mm -hmm. But I was halfway through the book almost before I realized, hey, this is in the present tense. Yeah. And yet I was still loving it. So huh. if I could capture that kind of uh, ability to bring people in, immerse them completely in the story so that they don't even notice the things that usually annoy them, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I would love to capture that. Um, as far as authors in the genres in which I've written, I really liked Edgar Rice Burroughs. Mm -hmm. I, I read everything I can find that, that he has written. Of course, everybody loves Tolkien, and I don't even pretend to try and go there. He is kind of in a class all by himself. Right. I, uh, I have to admit, I, I'm trying to think of some great fantasy that I've read recently. And... Uh, well, I, I did read some of uh, Brian McClellan's uh -huh. Flintlock Fantasy. Uh -huh. um, very good. I enjoyed that. 
I couldn't, I can't put my finger on, on something that, that I think that he does so exceptionally well that I want to steal it uh, or, you know, grab that ability. Sure. Sure. Um, maybe, maybe marketing. <laughs> well, yeah, I would, yeah. There are many authors whose marketing abilities I'd love to steal. Yeah. Eric Flint. I, I, I enjoy his writing. Mm -hmm. um, the 1631, 1632, um, those books. But again, I, I can't put my finger on what it is about it that makes me like it. Sure, sure, sure. Well, that's perfectly all right, just as long as we get a general sense of there's something there. In in, uh, in the Western genre, mm -hmm. um, I think most people like Louis L'Amour. Mm -hmm. And what I particularly liked about his style was his ability to tell a ripping story in a short amount of words and pages mm -hmm. you know he doesn't become larry mcmurtry who's a great writer right. but i think he would tell a better story in a third of the in the third of the book <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that ability to be concise and still capture everything that you need to capture is very right. difficult yeah don't wander off into long boring descriptions that don't add to the book right although right. I think some people want all the ambiance they can get, all of the, every little feel and texture. So that, that appeals to a lot of people. And so I don't have anything against authors who no, do that. Sure. Sure. It's just, it's a different style, a different way of sure. looking at the world. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. Oh, writing. It's such fun. And then you get to the editing process, which is, um, always entertaining <laughs> so how many edits do you go through before you say yes this is acceptable not enough not enough um and, and that's 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 the that's the true answer not enough once mm -hmm. i've gone through and think that uh, my story's great and uh you know later i always think about something it's usually while i'm writing another book mm -hmm. I think, oh, you know what? This might have been good. So I, I don't have a, I don't have a number, but uh, generally the story sticks um, as, as I first write it. Mm -hmm. I don't do a lot of substantive editing. Sure, sure. Once in a while, I may go back and say, yeah, I need a paragraph to bolster this aspect of this character's uh, um, outlook or background. Um, or you know to make it to make more sense when they do this thing later, mm -hmm. um, but the story generally is is fixed in place once I write it, and then it's just you know buffing it up and trying to knock out the errors. Sure, sure, yeah, that makes sense. I I can understand. I mean, once you get the story down and the general um, development of the characters, then a lot of it's just you know small tweaks here, small tweaks there, that sort of a thing. Right. I do try and go back. I, I understand that the council is probably against this. Mm -hmm. At least I've read it somewhere about don't go back and read what you wrote and then write. Just just write new stuff. Keep keep adding to your story. Get your whole story down without going back and rereading. Uh, but I, I can't do that. I like to go back, read what I wrote last time. Right. And and, and correct it as I go and then write my new stuff for my writing session that day. Mm hmm. Sure, I can understand that. I'm as long as you're, you know, generally happy with what you wrote before, and you don't need to change it massively. Then it's usually not that big of a deal. Yeah, I haven't had to throw out entire chapters yet. Oh, good. That's always helpful. <laughs> yeah, throwing out entire chapters, as long as I mean, you don't throw out the entire book, because <laughs> that would be very sad. Sad but true. <laughs> All right. For writery types uh, and readery types, if you want, to who are trying to get into um, your sort of area of expertise, and I'm going to go with the history bit as well as uh, generally causing trouble in multiple genres, um, uh -huh. are there traps that you think people might avoid? Uh, traps. What do you mean? 
what kind of traps um traps i've had people tell me things like um you know, it can be difficult if you get bogged down in character backstory, or sometimes it's problematic if you're focusing too much on description as opposed to events that are happening, or vice versa, even. Uh, so that sort of a thing. Okay, yeah, so so the, the writing traps that the writer can uh, fall into, mm -hmm. um, I, I think there are things that probably each writer loves about his, about his or her work. Sure. And they may want to spend a lot of time on those because that's what they get the most fulfillment out of mm -hmm. writing about. But the writer has to remember that somebody else is going to read this. I'm writing it for someone else to read. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are they going to like the same parts that I do? And if they don't, will that make them set it aside and choose a different book instead? Mm -hmm. So one, I would, I suggest trying to use not just the stuff you love, but the other stuff that's necessary to make a good story. Right. My basic rule of thumb is write what you want to read. That's a good one. And that especially applies to pacing, I think. Mm -hmm. um, keep. I've read books where it's one very good writers that I thought, man, this is great stuff, but it was just running from one battle to another battle. And I finally got, I just couldn't take it anymore. Yeah. Um, I did finish the book, but I didn't go on to the next one in the series, mm -hmm. um, but it, it was a f fantastic writer. So I, it was just the, the, uh, it was a pace that I didn't like. I, I couldn't, couldn't keep up with. Sure. Sure. Yeah, definitely different styles match different readers and different writers and whatnot. With regard to characters and world building, I think less is more. Mm -hmm. You know, just show that tip of the iceberg and let the reader imagine the rest until you need to provide more. Right. Then when you provide more, that will focus them a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, that's why we read is because we like to use our imagination. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. When when I say um, say this, for instance, oh, there was a bear over there. You know, we each get a, in our mind a different idea of what that what that bear looks like. Mm -hmm. And unless it's critical to the story, I don't need to describe every aspect of the bear. Sure. Although now that you've got me thinking about it, I'm wondering what that bear does look like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going with your standard uh, black bear eating the garden. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. I definitely grew up in the, in the mountains. <laughs> Not a teddy bear uh, or a panda. Oh, pandas are nice, too. Yeah. Yeah, those are always fun. Definitely not the first thing that pops into my mind when I see or I hear bear. Me neither. <laughs> all right, well, it has been absolutely fantastic talking with you. Uh, you should perhaps remind us of all of the books that you've got so we can keep track because you know all always... right well well right now i'm i'm writing the sequel to the tomahawks and dragonfire series mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. those books are threading the rude eye power to hurt and there's a lot of hurting that goes on in that book oh, no. <laughs> and clamorous harbingers uh -huh. which is a great climax to the to that uh, trilogy. Oh boy. Uh, my, my Western books, Justice in Season and Justice Resurgent. Mm -hmm. My noir detective novel, which is a little bit humorous, a little bit silly at times, uh, called Smoke. And uh, it, it is my favorite, I have to admit. Mm -hmm. I've also done another one called Finding Jack, which okay. um, is, a, is a, also a fantasy. It, it's an alternate fantasy world. Ah. Uh, a, a boy gets sucked into another world, um, ah. which is a fantasy version of the town he lives in. Ooh, that would be fascinating. I feel like my town would be far more exciting if there were fantasy elements involved. <laughs> right. So that's, uh, I think that's all of them. Seven books so far, working on number eight. Okay. Well, very exciting.
and we thank shall thank you so much for having me yeah yeah it was great fun and i will be absolutely sure to include all of the links for your stuff in the description because sometimes google algorithms are problematic and it's helpful to actually have clickable links great thank you yep we'll have a fantastic day uh do cause you know some trouble because it's thursday and because you can i aim to misbehave <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.